So hi again, everyone. Welcome to this evening's A Day in the Life of a Med Student panel. I'm Dr. Amanda Dye from Beyond Barnard, and I am thrilled to uh, to, to have our panelists introduce themselves. Um, I think we can just kind of start anywhere. Uh, panelists, if you wouldn't mind, tell us your names, um, when you graduated and what you studied at Barnard and where you are now in terms of stage of medical education and medical school. Um, Grace, would you start us off? Sure. Um, hi everyone, my name is Grace. I graduated in 2019. Um, I'm currently at Harvard Medical School, just started my second year on rotation. So um, Aisha and I are about seven weeks into rotations so can speak briefly to that phase of the journey. Um, I also took a few gap years, so happy to chat about that as well. Awesome, thank you. Aisha, why don't you go next? Hi everyone, my name is Aisha. I graduated, I graduated uh, in 2020 from Barnard and like Grace, I'm also a second year medical student at Harvard, currently in the thick of my medicine rotation. And I also did two gap years prior to um, coming to med school. Bless you both for being here in this very busy time. Um, Lily, how about you next? Hi, um, I'm Lily. I graduated from Barnard in 2018 and I'm an M2 at Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine. Um, and if you do the math, I did four gap years. So happy to talk about that. Awesome. Uh, Clarity, would you go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Clarity, and I graduated from Barnard in 2019. Um, I'm currently an M2 at the Cleveland Clinic um, with Case Western Reserve in Ohio. Awesome. And Finola, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Finola. Um, I studied neuroscience at Barnard and graduated in 2018. Um, I took two gap years, and now I am an MS4 at Jefferson at Sydney Kimmel Medical College. Um, so I'm in the process of applying for a psychiatry residency. And finally, Sabine. Hey, everyone. I'm Sabine. Um, I graduated from Barnard. Sorry, my um, Outlook. I'm not sure if the other med students on this know that, like, alarm. I feel like everyone uses Outlook <laughs> in medical school. Anyways, I'm Sabine. Um, I graduated Barnard in 2017. I studied anthropology and was an ambivalent pre-med when I was at Barnard. Um, and yeah, took big proponent of the gap years. I took three um, between uh, graduating from college and going to med school. Also took a gap year before Barnard as well. Um, and I'm a fourth year. So like Finola, I'm just kind of hanging out at this point. Life's pretty good. Um, and I'm applying into family medicine. Awesome. Thank you all so much for being here. So I'm going to kick it off with a few questions. I'm just going to throw these out. Anybody who wants to answer is welcome to answer. Um, because I know we've got a mix of folks in the room, some folks who are new students at Barnard and some who are um, even recent grads who are, who are planning for the application cycle. I'd love to talk a little bit about kind of how you all became sure about your professional paths. So um, one of the questions that I always love to ask is, um, can you tell us about experiences that you had in college that were particularly helpful in informing your decision affirmatively to say yes, I want to go to medical school. This is the right pathway for me. I can I can go first. Um, and let's see. So I think two things I was really involved with at Barnard. One of them was health leads. I'm not sure if that's still in existence now. Um, but I think my primary goal while I was at Barnard was to um, really engage in like public health work that would allow me to connect with varied groups of people. So um, through Health Leads, I was I worked as kind of a volunteer case manager at Harlem Hospital um, and developed one on one relationships with patients, kind of supporting their uh, more of their social needs and collaborating with doctors in that process as it related to their health. Um, which was kind of my first exposure to uh, seeing how medicine can really be used as a tool for advocacy and social justice. Um, I think 
like I found through those experiences that the body really f- reflects what's going on in society. And I think I've found that like, I wanted to be a part of, you know, supporting a patient in, in healing their body and whatever, you know, and supporting their, um, their growth. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, I think how I kind of landed on it. Awesome. Thank you. important experiences from anybody else? I can go next. Yeah. I think for me, I was, I wasn't sure a hundred percent that I was very similar to Sabine, like very ambivalent, like med student, even though I was a biology major, I wasn't exactly sure if I wanted to be, if I was pre-med or not, but sort of like the biology um, major kind of like falls kind of hand in hand, with like being pre-med, um, you see, take like an additional few classes and you're essentially pre-med. And I think, um, what really sort of uh, convinced me that like I want to pursue medicine is honestly like patient interaction and volunteering. There is this really, there's a really great um, nursing home in Harlem. It's called TCC. And there's like a whole program that essentially recruits like Columbia and Barnard students to essentially volunteer at this nursing home. And at up until like volunteering at this nursing home, I had done a lot of like research and it was like very like heavy on like biology and like basic science. And like, that was all fun, but I didn't, I didn't know if I even liked interacting with like patients. Do I like talking to people? Do I like working with like, do I like working on an inter- interdisciplinary team with like chaplains and social workers and nurses? And I think that experience at that nursing home really just convinced me that I actually really like working with people and like other, other professionals. Um, and like, in addition to like liking biology, it was like this human interaction that I really like fell in love with. Um, and so I think very like just volunteering at this nursing home was like a really pivotal moment for me. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry if you can hear sirens in the background. Washington Heights. Anybody else uh, important experiences that were helpful to you in making your decision? Mm-hmm. I'm happy to jump in. I honestly didn't make my decision in college. So I just want to like shout out anyone who feels like they might not be able to by the end of four years, because I think, you know, you're still really young. And like, that's not a lot of time to explore. Um, One thing I did during college, though, being an ambivalent pre-med was volunteer at Mount Sinai Morningside. And I would say like, that's such an amazing resource right in the backyard of Barnard. I would encourage you all to take advantage, whether it's volunteering or shadowing. I ended up meeting a mentor there who wrote a med school recommendation for me. And I didn't really even like do research with him or anything that significant beyond, like Aisha said, explore patient interactions and see what the hospital environment was like and understand what it means to be a doctor. Um, So I would say like, that's a really like world-class hospital that is blocks away and made it really convenient to go in the early morning and then be at class, you know, later in the day. Um, And then we'll probably get to the gap year question, but I think that's really what ended up helping me make the decision. Um, And I would just say that like, it's important to explore that inkling that you might want to go into medicine during college, but also that I think a lot of us here maybe didn't, weren't able to make that final decision while being students at Barnard. That's a really good and important point. Thank you, Grace, for bringing that up. Maybe, oh, Fenella, go ahead. I was going to say, I honestly completely agree with Grace. I always knew I was very interested in medicine. Um, and in college, I sought out every shadowing opportunity I could get my hands on, um, every opportunity I felt like would mirror a clinical experience. But I also wanted to spend my time in college really doing other things I loved, like exploring the arts and theater um and really you know like exploring all my passions and things I knew I might not do as a career uh and then I really used my two gap years to work in a clinical team setting um I got a job working at Cornell um doing clinical research and you know I I made sure that that job was something where I would be working very closely with patients and with attending physicians and in a multidisciplinary team And then outside of work, I spent a lot of time volunteering with Crisis Text Line, which I felt like really kind of started my interest in psychiatry um, and, you know, getting to work one-on-one with people um, in a really vulnerable place. And I think that 
I was also an ambivalent pre-med. I always knew the interest was there, but during my gap years, like that work and that volunteering were what really solidified it for me. So it's okay if you're not sure. And if you have other interests and you want to really explore those and think about other careers, like Barnard is wonderful and there are so many opportunities for everything. And all of those things you're doing now will inform your career. Um, Even when you go into medicine, like your background in the humanities, your background in whatever it is that you're doing is going to bring you so much in what you do in the future. It's a really good segue into my next question, which is about kind of how prepared you felt going into your education. So um, I'd love to ask you all, you know, thinking about the academic background that you got at Barnard, how did it feel to to transition into being a medical student? How well prepared did you feel for the academic expectations of your programs? I can speak to that. Um, I think I had a lot of friends that started med school before me that went to Barnard and I feel like I kind of heard from them like their experience and I feel like I kind of had the same thing. I think going to Barnard puts you in an advantage um, in terms of having small class sizes and like encouraging you to speak up and like say your thought process and I think that's something that I wasn't as confident with when I was like in high school. And even when I graduated college, I don't know if I would have been as confident in myself. And and it's kind of like when I took those gap years where I kind of developed that. But I do think Barnard really fosters that aspect. And then in terms of the workload, it's just different. Um, I think everybody here just knows it's just a ton more information. And I don't think there's anything any school could really prepare you for, for that aspect. But I do think like the amount of work ethic that I had to have at Barnard to be a neuroscience major, like that kind of just came right back when I started med school. Um, Yeah, I would like to echo what Lily said, just like in terms of like being well prepared um, with regards to interactions in small groups. Like we have small groups like many times at Spring, like I find my skills that I learned at Barnard just like kicking in. And I think that's something that even served me well during my gap year. So I was a biochemistry major. Um, And I do feel like, again, the information is a lot. Um, We go like in depth and um, whatever, but I still feel like um, I had a good enough foundation, at least for biochemistry, that like for our biochemistry modules, I literally use my Barnard notes. Like I just like literally pull up my notes and they've been sufficient. Um, but I think the greatest thing for me was just like being able to interact with different people um, and just being able to have like a, a nice intellectual conversation in a respectful manner. I think that's something that I learned from Barnard. Um, I can jump in as well. I feel like medical school, the curriculum is so different from anything that you've ever learned before. I feel like no matter what undergrad you go to, nothing can prepare you for the content you're going to learn in medical school. I felt like Barnard taught me how to learn and it taught me the work ethic in order to be able to learn everything in medical school. Um, So I felt really prepared from that standpoint. I remember being really nervous starting medical school because one, I was an anthropology major um, and two, uh, studying for the MCAT was really hard um, and I had taken a good amount of gap years. So I was nervous to get back into the swing of um, academics and I think I was pleasantly surprised. I will always say hands down the hardest I worked was at Barnard like (laughs) I think that that you 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 all are grinding and I think it's a different kind of grind when you are in pre-med classes and you know the the getting into medical school is still unknown at that point. There's a real distinction and transition, I think, that happens once you're in medical school. Um, This might just be a testament to UMass, but I do think that all other programs have this. One, there's this camaraderie and solidarity. Not to say that Barnard pre-med classes didn't have that, but there was definitely like a competitive edge to it that I don't think the same thing exists in medical school. My first two years are pass fail. I worked really, really hard, but I think because you're not competing for like rank or value, you know, any, anything like that, you really learn to work more collaboratively and study collaboratively. Um, And I also think 
uh, that once <laughs> the hardest part about med school is getting in, I swear. Um, <laughs> and I think once you're in, um, it would only be in the best interest of these medical schools to support you in every way they can. If you think of it from a, like just a, a purely, um, kind of cynical lens, like it only looks, it looks better for them if all of their students graduate and all their students do well. Um, so I feel like it's just, it's just getting to this point, but once you get there, you, you got it. <laughs> or less cynically, they're making an investment in you. So they want to make sure that they're protecting their investment. I think both are, are reasonable. <laughs> so I also wanted to ask, uh, not by design, but just by the fact that, you know, this is the case. All of you took at least some time between uh, college and starting your medical education. Um, and this is one of the most common questions that I get, you know, is it okay to take time between undergrad and medical school? What do people do during that time? So I'd love to just kind of go around and ask you all to, to tell us a little bit um, about what you did uh, during, during your gap year or years. And uh, if you did multiple things, please tell us about all of them. I can start because I am a reformed gap year pessimist, I would say. I was really nervous to take gap years. And I actually ended up taking one more than I intended to. So I can kind of go through. But essentially, I worked at a digital health startup for two years, which I kind of started to do while at Barnard by just like cold emailing people um, and getting a lucky response. I, I interned at the company uh, the summer prior to my senior year. And then I ended up working there. Uh, it's called Parsley Health for about two years thereafter. Um, and that attempt was really to test my hypothesis that I wanted to be a doctor because I was working more on like the business side of medicine, doing clinical operations and wondering like if that would be enough for me. And like, then I could be involved in clinical ish work, but not have to go through med school. And ultimately I left that opportunity like having really enjoyed it and learned a ton, but realizing that I still had the itch to pursue medicine. Um, and then actually I transitioned, well, during that job, I was studying for the MCAT and I had a, um, sorry, this is going to take me back, but I had a September MCAT date and my last practice test was not where I wanted it to be. And I had a whole crisis. I remember standing on the corner of 73rd street, right in front of Joe coffee, <laughs> falling my eyes out like oh my life is over and I just decided you know I need to take a January test and I'm gonna like take another gap year COVID was brewing like it ended up being the best decision I could have made but I remember viscerally the anxiety associated with taking another year and feeling like I was getting older and um, you know obviously the financial aspect is something to consider too so um, that's what I did for my first two years and then while applying I made like a 180 and worked in clinical research at Mount Sinai for about a year, wanting to like see what that was like, because I had never done clinical research. And also totally transparently, like wanting a nine to five job while I was applying for med school, because it's really a rigorous application process and working at a startup while applying for med school just wasn't feasible for me. Um, and then for like the last few months, I guess it was six months before school, I ended up going back to another startup um, that time. It was like behavioral health um, because similar to Fanola, I feel like I might have an interest in psych. So um, yeah, I kind of bopped around everywhere. And I would say what I learned throughout that time is like every experience only made me a stronger applicant. And frankly, like when it came time to interview, I talked a little bit less about my time at Barnard and a lot more about my gap years. Um, so I would say, like, just think of what kind of story you're building towards in terms of choosing experiences that will help make you a more well-rounded and interesting applicant. Yeah, I can go. So I took um, three gift years after I graduated. And for me, it was like a combination of, like, being so scared of the MCAT, um, but also I'm an international student, so I knew it was going to be like a very hard process for me. 
so I wanted to make sure that when I was finally like applying, I was putting like forward, like my best foot forward. Um, and then the third reason was that I was really interested in research. And so even when I was about to graduate, I was kind of like applying for like PhD programs, master's programs. So I was kind of like not sure if I was going to do like the MD PhD route or if it was just going to be the MD route. Um, and so taking time off like the three years that I took off kind of solidified that for me that, okay, I just really was interested in the MD side of things because I did get a chance to do a lot of research. Like when I was at Barnard, I did some research um, at Columbia where like I was working with bacteria and then I was like, oh, maybe I want to do more of like things with people. And so I started working with Professor Siever um, and we were working on like metallocyanines. And then from there on, I was like, oh, maybe I want to do like infections that are more like relevant to like where I come from and things like that. And so I worked at the Reagan Institute, um, which is like an institute of MGH, MIT and Harvard. And they specifically do a lot of like infectious research um, and also like immunology. And so that was like a good space for me to be in because I got to really explore my research interest and feel like, okay, I actually have done research. I have something to show for it, but it was not necessarily something that I wanted to do like as my primary um, thing. Um, and so that's when I had like a stronger conviction to be like, okay, I'm just gonna apply to medical school. Um, so the gap year was really helpful in just like solidifying the fact that I wanted to be in medicine versus research. Awesome, thank you. Um, that was kind of the same for me too. Um, I think when you asked the first question about what solidified um, wanting to go into medicine in when I was at Barnard, like I kind of was delayed in terms of all of that because I was a really competitive figure skating skater for the first two years. Um, and like, I'd leave Barnard at like 3 PM on Friday and get back at like 10 PM on Sunday. Um, so I didn't really have time to do anything else. Um, so I, you know, I did, um, like a, a clinical volunteering thing at HSS um, my senior year. And then I mostly just did research. So I, I was interested in medicine, kind of like everybody here, but I didn't really know what it consisted of. Um, and I think my gap years were fun, fundamental in terms of one, learning what it was like to be a doctor and working in medicine and two, like finding my passion for it. Um, like my first gap year, I did clinical research. So I was like closer to, you know, what it's like, but it was still really research focused. Even though I worked with doctors, I was able to shadow them and that was cool. Um, but I was still also kind of like towing the line between, do I want to do a PhD M or an MD or an MD PhD? Like I still didn't really know. Um, and it wasn't until I started working at Columbia Fertility Center, um, and I did that for the two years before starting med school, um, where I just like fell in love with patient care, um, and I fell in love with women's health. And I think like going to a women's college, that all like came back and it was like in me somehow, but it didn't come out until I worked at this clinic um, and just, you know, supporting women through miscarriages, not being able to get pregnant, working with same sex couples that, you know, are trying to get pregnant um, and have to go to a clinic. Um, and while I was in that role, I really liked how I was able to directly help patients, but I still found myself wanting to do more. And by the end of my role there, I was like making my differential in my head of what I think they had and what tests they needed. And I was just like, yeah, I want to be the person that's doing that. So it was kind of a long progression, but I think now I know more of who I am and what kind of doctor I'm going to be. So it was important for me. Definitely. I think, so um, I took three gap years before med school. The first two, I worked as 
a um, prenatal postpartum care coordinator at a clinic in the Bronx, um, which was awesome. They they trained me, this particular um, organization, the Institute for Family Health, trained me to become a doula, to become a certified lactation consultant. And I got to work with patients from like their initial prenatal visit up until their baby was one years old, which was just the coolest thing. I, I feel like I, I knew I wanted to do family medicine before I knew I wanted to like go to medical school through this experience in all honesty. Um, and then I kind of got to a point where I was like, I feel like this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. And when else am I going to get a chance to try something completely different? So I spent my third year, um, third gap year working on a farm, um, where I was by far the least useful person there. Um, and, uh, just wanted to do something completely different that I wouldn't otherwise get exposure to. I think, um, it's really easy for your identity as a pre-med student, as a med student, as a resident to like become your whole identity. And I think for me, because I was really, knew that this is what I wanted to do. I was like, I gotta, I gotta like explore other parts of myself before I commit to this um, or while I'm in the process of committing to this, I guess. And I think through that experience, um, I just, I came into medical school with a little bit, a little bit at a different pace, I feel like from, from some of the folks who had just come from, from undergrad, because you're just so used to that grind versus I think taking gap years um, really gives you a little bit of perspective and, and time and um, helps you recognize the importance and start to work towards some sort of work-life balance. Um, so I think in that way, it was really refreshing. Awesome. Anyone else want to share anything about gap years? Oh, I should go ahead. I can share. Uh, very similar to like Clarity and Lily, I ended up doing uh, like, I was a research assistant during my gap years. So during undergrad, I um, was, um, I worked at Columbia's Medical Center doing like skin cancer research and like it was a focus on immunology. And at that point, by the time I graduated, I wasn't sure if I want to do MD or MD PhD. And so I figured I'll do like, and I also graduated during COVID. So it was like really weird time. Like I wasn't exactly sure like what was happening. So taking all that together, I ended up doing two gap years and I worked at Rockefeller a university on the Upper East Side. And Rockefeller, the way I got connected to that job was that Rockefeller recruits Barnard students. Like every spring, um, they, they, they'll they come to campus and they'll like interview interview students. And so it was like a very easy, it was just a really easy way to find like a research assistant position, which I was really thankful for. Um, and then I think for me, I needed I needed those two I needed those two gap years for a lot of different reasons. A like determining what whether I wanted to pursue a PhD, like MD PhD versus MD only. Um, I ended up doing I ended up applying to MD PhD programs and MD only programs because I still wasn't sure by the end of it. But um, now I'm I'm doing MD only now, so thank God. Um, and I needed like I needed, I needed help deciding what I wanted to do, and then I also just needed like a break, like my gap years. It is so nice having a nine to five job, and then after five o'clock no studying. Like you, you can like make plans on the weekdays. You can have a life. You're not, you're not like, there's nothing in the back of your head saying, Oh my God, I have to like, I have to go study. I have to like go write that essay. It is so nice. <laughs> a 95 where you just don't have to worry about like any, like you just like be a human. And, um, I, I think I really needed that after Barnard. It was, you know, Barnard is an amazing place, but it's hard. Like it's like that could, like it's really academically rigorous. And I really needed those two gap years to just kind of like calm down. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I think I already spoke a little bit to really wanting to confirm my decision of medicine, but like Aisha said, um, I also needed a little bit of a break. Um, going into medical school, you're going to have very little control over your schedule for the next few years. And I really wanted to take time and spend it with people I loved. Um, I wanted to stay in New York a couple of more years. And, you know, my friends were all staying in New York after Barnard. Um, I wanted to put time into other passions besides medicine and explore those parts of myself before I went to med school. Um, there's also financial reasons for taking a gap year. Um, I do think like I was very lucky in that I had some family support for my paying for applications, but they're really, really expensive. Um, and so I wanted to put aside a little bit of money for that as well. Awesome. Thank you.
So before I turn the questions over to the audience, which we'll do in the moment, in a moment, I want to ask one more question uh, for anybody who wants to answer. So I find that one of the parts of the process that sometimes feels like a little bit of a switcheroo to applicants is that you spend a long time kind of preparing to be generally like ap applying for medical school, right? You know, everybody sort of takes basically the same classes. Everybody develops a portfolio of experiences that have some similar contours, although the details of the experiences are obviously very different. But then when it comes time to apply to like 15 or 20 or so programs, you have to pick a list of programs that really fit you, both in terms of your metrics, but also in terms of just like the things you want to accomplish as a medical student, the, the resources that you want to have access to, the kinds of populations you want to work with. So I'd love to ask you all, to tell us a little bit about, you know, how how did you go about choosing schools to apply to? And how did you end up choosing the school that you ultimately matriculated at? Well, I will go because that's actually a really exciting question for me. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, I was kind of torn between, oh, MD, PhD, whatever. Um, and it just so happened that the Cleveland Clinic has like a specific program, which is uh, like it trains physician scientists. So it's a five year program. Um, and during like the fourth year, you literally take a year off of medical school. Um, before you apply for residency and you can just do research in whatever you want to do. And I thought that was like really interesting for me because I, although I decided to do medicine only, I still felt like I like being in the lab. I like basic science. And so that kind of like gives me room to explore that. And our curriculum is structured such that like throughout the three years prior to that, you actually develop skills that allow you to lead your own project and actually see it through during that year. So that was like one major thing for me um, in terms of like picking the Cleveland Clinic specifically. But the other thing is finances. Um, that's like a huge part, like application process as well as like thinking about the five years that I'm going to be here. And my school is tuition free and they offer scholarships for like students. And so for me, that was also like a huge thing, just like a financial burden lifted. So that, that was the other reason. And then finally, my like my school takes only 32 students, like our classes is just 32 students. And I felt like I needed to grow just like in terms of interacting with people and like I felt like I could do that better if I was in a small space, because in that way, you're more intimate with your classmates, you get to know everyone, you're comfortable with talking to everybody. Um, and so that was like a really important aspect in my decision as well. Thank you. Yeah, I guess the question kind of has two parts. I think the first part is how did I pick schools to apply to? Um, I kind of took a look at what my GPA was at Barnard and what my MCAT score was and making the list. Um, you'll be able to find lists like on the internet, like on Reddit that list out all of the medical schools, their average and standard deviation GPAs and MCAT scores. And I literally took all of my data. I took that spreadsheet. I eliminated everywhere that I did not geographically want to be. And then out of that, I kind of looked at what were some target programs for me? What were some programs that felt more like safety programs in terms of my score and GPA? And what were a couple of reach programs that would be like my dream programs if I got inter to interview with them? Um, and then I fit, I narrowed that list down to the amount of programs I was going to apply to. Um, so that's kind of how I did it. I based it very much on statistics. And then after I factored in the statistics on geography, um, in terms of actually choosing a program, once I interviewed, the biggest things for me, I think, were culture of the program and um, geography, because I ended up choosing during the beginning of COVID. Um, so culture was a big thing. I think it can be really hard to get a feel for program culture. Um, but when you're interviewing at these medical schools, like definitely talk to a lot of people, ask a lot of questions, like talk to people outside the formal interview process. Um, I know I was really lucky that I got to interview in person way back when, 
Um, but I think they're probably going to stay virtual for a while. Um, I, you know, wanted somewhere that was going to be supportive, collaborative, where I was going to be able to get really good mentorship and have really good clinical experiences with people who wanted to teach me. Um, and I think that's what I really found at Jefferson. Um, I got that vibe from a couple of other programs, too, that I interviewed at. Um, I ended up picking Jefferson because it was really close to my family in Philadelphia because at the time COVID was hitting um, and I wanted to be a drive away. So. Any other thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I can speak. So I have a similar, I'm not going to talk about like how I did my algorithm for applying because um, I don't think I did it well, so don't listen to what I said, but, um, I, when I was in, uh, like when I was in high school, when I was applying to Barnard, I felt like the essays I wrote for Barnard were the most like telling of who I was as a person. And I didn't feel like I was just regurgitating, rearranging all my words and making myself seem better than I was and it wasn't really as genuine but with Barnard I just kind of wrote from the heart um and somehow my secondaries for Virginia Tech I felt the same way um so even from the beginning when I was applying like their secondary questions were just different than a lot of other schools um they were like oh like what do you do like for fun and I wrote about how I like swimming in the summer in a lake and I like hiking. And now I get to do that here, which is great. Um, so I don't know, I got a feeling when I was writing the secondaries. And then when I interviewed, I also just got like really good vibes. Like I, the students just genuinely seemed happy. Um, again, it's a small program. There's only 50 students in my class. Um, so I wanted to have like that one-on-one -on -one mentorship and wanted to to be able to seek out mentors and not have to compete for them. Um, and I feel like I've definitely gotten that. Um, and I'm really close with my classmates and um, I feel really supported. So I feel like I chose the right place. I remember you saying all of those things about Virginia Tech when you were in the application process, the writing and how good you felt about the interview. And that's why I was so excited when you got the acceptance. Anybody else have anything they want to add about this? I'll just mention, I'm blanking on the name, Dr. Dry, you can remind me what it is, but it's like an AMCAS database, like MSAR. Or yes. Okay. I just want to plug MSAR because in addition to Reddit, like I was on that website a lot looking for the data piece about like GPA, MCAT score, where can I fit? Um, and also I would highlight that like geography is not a trivial criteria. That's honestly what drove a lot of my school selection I grew up in Connecticut I went to Barnard and then I did my gap years in in New York and I knew like realistically even if I got into every California school like I wouldn't choose it so I think being honest with yourself about how close you want to be to family some people are like I need to get out and experience something different that's totally cool too I was that on like the a little bit more mild end of the spectrum where I really felt like I should push myself to leave New York because I love New York and I had grown so comfortable there and my sister's there and my mom's in Connecticut and all my friends are there and it was really hard to make the decision to leave New York um, but again like I'm in Boston I've taken the Amtrak multiple times back to New York to visit people and like that has brought me so much joy and you know, positive mental health throughout the first year. Um, having my mom be able to come up on a weekend for like 24 hours because I'm busy. Like, I think those things really matter to me. Um, and I think it's important to not trivialize that because we all need support. And like, even if you're, you know, crushing it at medical school, like it's really hard. And sometimes you just want a hug from someone you know and love from home an important point. I just want to echo what Grace said. Um, I think that my primary driving factor was location because I when I was a, when I, I applied to MD PhD and so in my head I was like I have to spend like almost eight years in this area 
And I was like, I do not want to spend eight years like on, on the West coast or in the Midwest, just because like, I'm not from those areas and I have no idea what life would be like. And so I, for me, like location was so important. And even like, like now that I've chosen just to do the MD only path, I think location is so important because you're going to spend like, like, uh, like four years in an area. And I wanted to be, I wanted to stay on the East coast, close to family in New Jersey and New York. Um, and so I think location was like my driving factor as well. Like I, I think I mostly applied to East coast schools and then a couple of schools in the Midwest and West coast. But the minute I got like an acceptance on the East coast, I like stopped interviewing for the West coast and Midwest schools. Cause I was like, realistically, even if I got into a school in West and on the West coast, I would end up choosing the East coast um, for, for just because of location. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I want to open it up for attendees. Uh, I'm sure you all have questions and I welcome them. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. So if, uh, if you want to put a question in there, I can read it out to our panelists. If you want to raise your hand or just come off mute and ask, please feel free. Yeah, Mary, go ahead. Hey, y'all. Uh, I'm Mary. I just recently graduated from Barnard this past May, and I'm like in my first of two planned gap years. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask, I know like finances is like a personal question, but I guess I was wondering if any of you, like I know I want to go to medical school, I'm going to start the application process, and I have been like considering um, like the military health profession scholarship program or kind of a national program. Um, and I was wondering if any of you considered one of those programs or know people who are a part of them or like are a part of them yourselves. And when it comes to like finances and finding a program that, you know, might be able to support you financially in return for like, you know, years. Um, I don't know what, if you have any views on that or advice, if I were to go down that path. Um, I have two friends that are in one of them is in the Navy one and one is in the army. I'm personally not in one. Um, and I think one thing to think about is if you have any idea of what specialty you want to go into, um, because like for me personally, I want to go into OBGYN. Um, and I think there's like three spots for like the Navy, for example. Um, so that would make matching really hard. Um, and you can do like, again, I don't know a ton about it, but you can do like a civilian match, but it just like makes things harder. Um, but if you want to do something like being internist or family medicine or surgery, I think it's a great option because they have a lot of, um, spots for that. Um, but yeah, another thing is if you're flexible in your location, um, you don't really, have a like I my impression is like the Navy and the Army and those places like kind of tell you what you're going to do with your service and you don't really have as much of a choice so like for me just thinking about me being older like I want to have a family and like um I I just didn't think it was really something that I considered but um I think those are some things to think about with it Um, so I personally do not know anyone and I was just going to speak to the issue of finances like if that's the primary concern um, I would invest some time in looking into programs that are like tuition free because I think a lot of medical schools are kind of moving in that direction I think NYU right now is um, tuition free and I think there should be more than that so if it's mainly finances um, I think you can come up with a list of like eight to ten schools that are tuition free which you could also consider in addition to that and just to add on um to the finance part, part even if schools aren't tuition free or debt free um there is financial aid for medical school which i like was like for some reason it was shocking to me for like i thought like medical school wouldn't have financial aid but there is financial aid for medical schools um so like once, like if you, if you want to like do the military program, because you're like really passionate about it. And like, that's where like, the, like that drives you. Like I would totally like tell you, like, go for it. 
But if like it's a finance problem, I would like, I would, I would like, I, I agree with what Clarity said, like maybe look into schools that are tuition free, debt free, like, or even have like, like financial aid. Cause most, I don't want to say most med schools, the med, there's definitely med schools, Harvard included that, that give financial aid. Um, so, and I know that's like a really scary topic because I actually was talking to an attending recently about like, how am I going to pay off my loans? And he was like, listen, like everyone pays off their loans and there's like programs in place. Like if you work at a nonprofit for 10 years, like your loan, like if you pay your loans for like those 10 years, then whatever's left over, it's forgiven. And a nonprofit, most hospitals are nonprofits. So there are ways where like you can get these loans paid off, but I don't want to like, um, undermine like what if you wanted to like do this pro, like do the military program because like you're really passionate about it, you should totally go for it but there are but if finances are the problem or like the, your main your major concern then definitely there are definitely options out there I just want to let you know that yeah so I think it's I think it's really hard um I didn't consider it for myself because I was considering a couple of the specialties as Lily said that you like it's really hard to do um in that program but I do know a bunch of people who are in that program at Jefferson um a lot of people really love the military programs they do give you a lot of money and they pay for your med school and if you're flexible on location and it's something you know that you're okay with doing I think it's a really great option um, I think it's hard because I think the tuition free programs tend to be very competitive medical schools. And I think that that's not an option for everybody, especially like if your undergrad GPA is already locked in or like what have you. Um, it definitely wasn't an option for me. Um, and I do think that there are other programs, though, that might be worth looking into, too, like consider the military program. I think a lot there's a lot of programs where geographically, if you commit to doing a certain number of years of practice there, after you finish residency, they will like pay off consecutive years of your student loans. I know one of those is Geisinger in um, Northeastern Pennsylvania. That's somewhere that I interviewed at, and they have a really great loan repayment program. You may have to do a primary care specialty, but if that's something you're interested in, then it's like totally great if you're okay with like staying in the Scranton area. Um, I know that there's a bunch of those throughout the country, though, so I think that that is, like, a fantastic option. I also know some people who are doing those, um, so there's a lot out there that's worth looking into. I think all are really good options, and they're there for a reason, and people do them for a reason. Um, I think before committing to something, definitely would advise, like, trying to find somebody who's gone through that program who can give you, like, a primary experience of it, Um and I'll give you my email at the end. I can try and find somebody in the military program if you want to hear from them. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Public public service loan forgiveness is a big deal for lots of people in lots of health professions programs. Um, definitely some of these programs that uh, that place uh grads in uh in underserved areas are also things to look into yeah and as Aisha said medical schools do offer financial aid um the tricky thing is that you're not really going to know what you get until you get close to the very end of the process um but it's definitely something that you can look into uh you know people who go to very wealthy schools sometimes do get very generous financial aid which I've benefited from uh in in my own life but um you know, even schools that you wouldn't necessarily expect to offer tons of scholarship aid sometimes have funding that just happens to be applicable to your case. Um, so it's worth applying broadly. It's worth considering lots of options um, because these are definitely big, big questions for basically everybody who goes to medical school. Yeah, Lillian. Um, first, Mary, I wanted to thank you for that question because it was also a program I was looking into and I think it's not as often um, spoken on. I had a question um, that's about the writing process. I find that the idea of putting your, your whole 3D person onto a piece of paper or into words is sort of a, a difficult experience, especially when there's a lot of things. First of all, you want to be genuine to who you are, but you also want to craft a narrative that is digestible for people who are looking at thousands of these. So I was wondering if anyone had tips on 
how to get those juices flowing, so to speak. I can chime in, Lillian. The writing was part of the process that gave me the most anxiety. I have always been like a fairly decent writer, but for some reason, writing like freaks me out. Um, I would say in terms of getting the juices flowing, like don't expect yourself to sit down and be able to write one of these essays like in a few hours, just randomly. Like I spent a lot of time just with the prompts in mind, going about my daily life and like trying to come up with stuff like on a run or like I had an encounter with someone that reminded me of a patient experience and then I was like oh that kind of makes sense if you're still in school anyone on this call people gave me this advice and I ignored it but I would highly recommend keeping a journal or like post-it notes or whatever works for you the notes app on your phone like there were so many times that I was reaching for straws trying to remember some vignette that I couldn't remember even with a young brain uh, from like three or four years earlier so I would say when like a moment strikes that you like you cry or laugh or like feel some emotion like jot it down in whatever way works for you um, and then kind of just you have that log so you're not starting from total scratch and that can apply both to college experiences and gap year experiences um, and then I would also say, like, really try to be open to people's advice, like not saying that you should circulate your essays to a million different people and they'll give you a contrasting input. But I think being vulnerable enough to share your work really at least served me well in the end in terms of like refining it and making sure that my voice was still maintained. I don't know if that's helpful, but I hear you. It's tough. Definitely very tough. In the interest of time, I want to get through some additional questions. Lillian, we will have more workshops, though, on the writing piece because it is hard for everybody. And Grace, I really appreciate you uh, giving that advice because that is what I tell every first year student who says, is there anything else I should think about? Yes, write things down. Um, Anna, do you want to go next? Sure. I had a question. I know somebody mentioned that, like, the Rockefeller Center did recruiting and bartered in the spring for like post-grad or uh, um, for gap year opportunities. And for other people, I was just wondering how you kind of, whether you got a clinical research position, how, how you got into that or other stuff you did in your gap year, how you acquired those positions. Anybody? I think it's called Handshake. Am I right? There are postings on Handshake. Rockefeller yeah. University does post there as well. Yeah. So I think I found my initial one on Handshake. Um, and then like I had three jobs during my gap year. So that's how I found my first one. But also look on um, LinkedIn and see what alums are doing. Um, the other two jobs that I got, like, it was kind of through word of mouth, like me finding out that they were even hiring. Um, so that is like a fundamental thing that I did not think was a thing. So if any of you guys want to do fertility or anything, you can email me. I'm sure Dr. Dye can send stuff out, but um, th that's like a little known thing where like they might not post about it, but like they definitely want Barnard students. They already know that Barnard students are great. Um, and I think using the alumni network um, is a great resource. Very, very good advice, Lily. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there are a number of institutions, like there are literal jobs, like specific jobs that I'm thinking of in my head that I know Barnard grads have held successively for like literally the past five years. So, um, and it, I'm sure it goes back farther than that. So definitely, you know, once you have a sense of what you want to do, talking to folks who have done similar things is a great way to get leads. Um, and we have one more question. Amruta, is that how you say it? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if, um, I mean, how you guys sort of utilized a Barnard, the SRI at Barnard, if you, if you did it at all, or because I know that's like a big thing in Barnard. And I was just wondering, like, um, your guys' experiences with SRI. And um, if you have time for a follow up question, the difference between like, MD, PhD, and just like MD only in terms of like rigor or the culture and uh, 
yeah, et cetera. I don't know if SRI was around for all of you. Yeah, I was going to ask. I don't think I know what that is. So Summer Research Institute provides funding for folks uh, doing research in natural sciences and computer science um, in mostly uh, in New York City. Um, it's a super popular program these days. Um, but yeah, did, did anybody do SRI? Aisha, did you? I did do SRI. I did SRI uh, my, soft, my sophomore and junior year. I think, yeah, that's when I did my, that, that's when I did SRI. And I think it's a great opportunity. Like if you are wanting to do research in a lab and want it to get funded, at least that's how it worked when I was there. It's like you essentially are like Barnard will give you funding to do research in a lab. So you get to choose your own lab, choose what you want to do. And then Barnard will like willingly fund you. And at the end you can like, you make a poster, which is great. Just really good. Just experience making a poster, like presenting it and like to all like your Barnard colleagues and your professors and I, I had a great time, SRI. Um, and I, and I, for both summers, I I did SRI in the lab that I did my research in, like throughout the year. So I highly, if you're into, if you're into research and like you want to get paid to do it in the summer, SRI is like amazing. I highly recommend it. It's really good. I also always add as an addendum to SRI, my little asterisk, there are literally hundreds of funded research programs around the country. So if you're thinking like, actually, I'd like to get out of New York, I still want to do research, but maybe there's something else. Uh, there's a cardiovascular research program at the University of Michigan that's huge, really interesting, has a very long history. There are programs at like the University of Cincinnati has really interesting neuroscience research programs. Um, Fred Hutchinson Can Cancer Center in Seattle does amazing summer research opportunities for folks who are interested in oncology. So there are tons and tons of opportunities out there. Research is great to take advantage of. Um, in the interest of time, because I know we are we are coming up on seven o'clock. Um, we can talk more offline about MD versus MD PhD, but for me, the big difference is the MD PhD is genuinely a research focused degree. It's for people who's who want their careers to be influenced by their understanding of and their practice in the clinical environment, but see themselves primarily as researchers. Whereas uh, the MD is a primarily clinical profession that can allow you to do research. Uh, and I think most, if not all, of our students, are our, our panelists are people who have, have done research as medical students uh, as well. So um, I want to say thank you all so much for being here, attendees and panelists. Panelists, it's so good to see you all. Um, so amazing to see how well you're doing. Really, really, we are so proud of you. Um, and we are so excited to see what happens in your next steps. Finola, Sabine, good luck with residency applications. Everybody else, good luck with clinical rotations. And uh, I really appreciate you all being here. Thanks, everyone.